Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. Filming today in Washington, I'm Peter Robinson. A senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, John Bolton served in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush in the Departments of State and Justice. During the administration of George W. Bush, John Bolton served as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security and as Ambassador to the United Nations. Ambassador Bolton, thank you for joining me. Glad to be here. Iraq, the threshold question, were we right to go to war? I don't think there's any question that the decision to overthrow Saddam Hussein was the correct decision. I think you have to look at what happened in Iraq uh, through the prism of two separate questions. Was the initial decision correct and was what happened subsequently uh, the way we wanted it to be? The answer to the first question, to me, despite the events of the six years after the invasion is still unquestionably yes. The regime itself, Saddam Hussein, his Ba'ath Party, were threats to peace and security in the region and the larger world. Whatever the extent of his weapons of mass destruction, there is absolutely no doubt that once Saddam got free of UN sanctions and UN weapons inspectors, he would have returned to the path of weapons of mass destruction. He kept together a thousand nuclear scientists and technicians. He called them his nuclear mujahideen. Mujahideen, they were clearly intended to be the source of a new nuclear weapons program. So overthrowing that regime, I think, really simply finished the unfinished business of the 1991 Gulf War. Listen to former Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Doug Fife. This is from his book, quote, when U.S. officials began to despair of finding weapons of mass destruction stockpiles in Iraq after Saddam's overthrow, their embarrassment apparently caused a radical shift in administration rhetoric about Iraq. The president no longer cited Saddam's record or threats as reasons for going to war. Rather, he focused almost exclusively on the aim of promoting democracy. Close quote. You just cited Saddam Hussein's threats as the reason for going to war. D did the Bush administration err in the way Doug Fife says they erred? Did they fail to make the case adequately and correctly for continuing the war? A absolutely. I, I think the shift to the rhetoric of democracy uh, undercut the support that uh, was very widespread in the American public. It's not that anybody doesn't want good things, including democracy, for the Iraqi people. But the fundamental reason to overthrow Saddam Hussein was the potential threat that he posed to us and to our friends and allies in the region. And to me, it was the regime itself that was the threat. Let me just make one quick mm -hmm. point on the WMD. The main thing people feared at that time was Saddam Hussein's chemical weapon stocks. That fear was not based on intelligence at all. It was based on Iraq's own declarations in 1991 as part of the ceasefire in the first Gulf War. And the fact that over all of the intervening years, uh, Saddam never produced records that showed he had destroyed those weapons as he claimed to the UN. The UN's last chief weapons inspector, Hans Blix, right. said to the Iraqis, if you have destroyed these uh, chemical weapon stocks, you have records, you have people uh, who can tell us about that destruction. He said, that stuff isn't marmalade. The Iraqis never produced it, and everybody, and I mean everybody, concluded that having declared the stocks of weapons and failed to show that he had destroyed them, the conclusion was the Iraqis still had those weapons. So let's be clear about what the concern was, and as I mentioned, the nuclear program mm -hmm. that would have come later. So I, I don't doubt to this day, despite all the uh, anguish that occurred after the overthrow of Saddam, the decision to remove that threat was entirely correct. All right, we've got three, as I see it, we've got three phases of the war. You tell me if, broadly speaking, I'm, this seems to me a reasonable way to sum it up. If I'm mistaken, say so. For the first three weeks, a magnificent success, purely in military terms. We move in, it's halfway around the world, move in quickly, Saddam Hussein's regime is gone. For more than four years, it goes badly. And then beginning in January, well, the president announces the surge in January 07, the surge goes well, turns it right around. Success, long stagnation, failure, and then success, right? I think that's a pretty good characterization. So what went wrong during that long, that four-year period when it just was slipping sideways? Well, I think the basic mistake took place in the immediate aftermath of Saddam Hussein. I think we looked at the circumstances we faced in Iraq, and for whatever reasons, uh, people will debate this for a long time, the president decided we needed a longer, more sustained American involvement, created the 
the uh, coalition provisional authority and basically put us in charge of the country. Now, I'm not critical of anybody, including Jerry Bremer, who bore those responsibilities. I don't think uh, the situation rests at, uh, at, uh, at their feet. I think it rests at the Oval Office because that's where the decision made sure. uh, was made not to turn things back over to Iraqis very quickly. Now, this is a controversial issue, but it seems to me clear that we would have been much better off in retrospect had we given authority to the Iraqis uh, as soon as we could after the overthrow of Saddam. An Illinois state senator speaking in 2002, quote, I am not opposed to all wars. You know where this one is going. What I am opposed to is a dumb war, close quote. That man is now president of the United States. Well, what should he do about Iraq? I, I hope what he does is take advantage of the victory that has now been won as a result of the third phase of the war that you mentioned, the surge, which mm -hmm. was both political and military. We've now seen provincial elections recently in Iraq. Just uh, a few weeks ago. Largely without violence. Uh, precursors to uh, parliamentary elections at the end of the year. Uh, it, the situation is far from resolved. That long period of drift and indecision uh, has caused a lot of harm. But basically things are moving in the right direction. I think President Obama should declare victory. That would be the smart thing to do. Uh, and not undercut this new government and not help increase the influence of Iran in the broader region by reducing the American president's well, precipitously. I want to go on to the next segment, but wouldn't the Obama administration say that they're doing just what you propose. We're going to get out of Iraq as quickly as we can and refocus our attention and send more troops to Afghanistan where there's still trouble. We're if, recognizing that things are going well in Iraq. Is that what you mean or not? That's not quite good enough? If, if we had focused on this right after the overthrow of Saddam, a different policy would have been possible. You have to play the hand that's dealt you as a new president. And I think reducing American presence too quickly will undercut our success both in Iraq and in the larger regional arena. Segment two, North Korea. 20 million people, more than 20 million people so poor they're always on the edge of starvation, a regime that combines Stalinism with a weird cult of personality centered on the leader Kim Jong-il, and in undoubted possession of nuclear weapons. What do Americans need to know about North Korea? Simply put, what does North Korea want? What are their aims? I think North Korea's central aim is to keep the regime in power. I think that's what a lot of this boils down to. This is not a regime that cares about its people. The, the average height and weight of the North Korean citizen has been declining over the past several decades. They're three to six inches shorter than their South Korean uh, counterparts. It's an, it, they've Who are done, genetically identical. Yeah, started right. from exactly the same base in 1945 when the war ended. Uh, so this regime is, is essentially a criminal regime. It will sell anything to anybody for hard currency. It uses its nuclear weapons as its ultimate trump card. What it cares about is itself. John Bolton on the North Korea policy of George W. Bush, quote, Mr. Bush's flaw was believing that negotiation and mutual concession could accomplish the U.S. objective, the end of proliferation threats from Pyongyang, when the objective of our adversary was precisely the opposite. Explain. What North Korea wants to do with the nuclear weapons is use them to protect itself against Japan, the United States, South Korea, and others. Uh, and I think to bargain with other countries like Iran, like Syria, uh, to help buttress their nuclear and ballistic missile capabilities and thus make themselves more immune. The fact is that the Bush administration in its second term uh, essentially adopted the suggestions of its democratic opposition engaged in multilateral negotiations with North Korea and what failed the, the, the six, six, party, six talks, party talks failed to stop its nuclear program. Secretary of State Clinton just a, a few days ago said that the Bush administration policy at its end was exactly right. Now that has to tell you something. That it was exactly wrong. Exactly. George W. Bush went to war in Iraq with allies screaming their protests. And in North Korea, he convenes six party talks, has everybody at the table, and dithers, in your view. What's, what's, why this contrast? What's going on there? Well, I think many people have, have criticized the Bush administration's policy on North Korea and elsewhere as being excessively unilateralist, as being confrontational, as, as not wanting to engage in diplomacy and negotiation. In fact, it was the exact opposite. The problem with the Bush administration policy for its last six years was that it failed to follow through on the logic of what it would actually take 
to end the North Korean nuclear weapons program. And that meant precisely isolating North Korea, getting China to apply pressure on the regime, and, and carrying it forward. Former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry, Democratic uh, Secretary of Defense, served as Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton. Not long before the successful nuclear test in North Korea, Bill Perry put a, wrote a column in the New York Times that shocked everyone because he called for an airstrike on the North Korean nuclear uh, facilities to take them out before they could actually achieve a nuclear capability. Was, what was your reaction? Did you think Bill Perry was as crazy as everybody thought he was? Well, or would that, is, was that exactly what the Bush administration should have done? Uh, unfortunately, it's what the Clinton administration should have done before the North <laughs> Koreans got the nuclear weapons. I mean, this is a fundamentally erratic regime. Think of it as Hitler in the bunker. Uh, and, and the risk to South Korea... If you've got Korea, Hitler in the bunker, once you set up that analogy, you have to get him. Well, I think the way you get him is to have the Chinese apply pressure. Here's another case of Secretary Clinton getting things wrong. She said to uh, a news reporter a few days ago during her Asia trip that South Korea was propping up the North Korean regime with aid. Uh, in fact, it's China that keeps North Korea going. China supplies 80 to 90 percent of North Korea's energy. China supplies a huge amount of food and humanitarian aid, mostly to keep the North Koreans in North Korea. China is the key to this. China could apply sufficient pressure to North Korea to stop that nuclear program. That's what our diplomacy should focus on. What is on. the Chinese motivation? Why don't they rein in Kim Jong-il? Why isn't that in their own interest? They have a lunatic with nuclear weapons on their border. I think it's clearly in China's interest to have North Korea without nuclear weapons. And that's what they say, and I take them at their word. What they're afraid of is that if they apply too much pressure to Kim Jong-il, they will collapse the regime. And if they collapse the regime, you'd see the two Koreas reunited. You'd see South Korean and American forces into North Korea to prevent chaos and to secure the nuclear weapons. And ultimately, I think China fears American forces on the Yalu River. They didn't like that movie the first time they saw it. They don't like it any better today. So their reaction is perfectly understandable in a way. Afraid to apply too much pressure on North Korea, they don't apply any at all. Is it impossible for us, now the Obama administration, now Secretary of Clinton, it would have been Condoleezza Rice a couple of months ago, is it impossible for us to say to Beijing, look, if this thing goes under, we'll be more than happy to let you handle it. You send in the humanitarian aid, you send in the, the uh, policing troops to keep order, you handle it. Believe us, we don't want to get involved there. Why, 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 shouldn't, why wouldn't we say that and why wouldn't it be credible to the Chinese if we did? Well, I think we could say something similar to that, which is we would be prepared to pick up a major chunk of the humanitarian cost if the North Korean regime collapsed. I, I don't think there's any getting away from Korean reunification. It, it is the future. Mm -hmm. But I think we could assure China that we would help if there were waves of refugees into China, as I say, help pick up the cost, uh, and ensure that uh, the reunification of Korea was not a threat to China. They fundamentally shouldn't be worried about this. They should be more worried about North Korea with nuclear weapons. All right. Russia. John Bolton on the Russian invasion of Georgia last summer, quote, we are facing the issue of how Russian, how, <coughs> excuse me, of how Russia plans to behave in international affairs for decades to come, close quote. Explain. Well, Vladimir Putin, when he was still president of Russia, said uh, about three years ago that the breakup of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. I think most of us think the breakup of the Soviet Union was a great way to end the 20th century, but that's obviously not Putin's view. And I think much of his policy, even today as prime minister, is devoted to reestablishing Russian hegemony in the space of the former Soviet Union. I don't think he necessarily wants to put the country together again. I don't think this is a return to communism. I think it's something else. But that, that invasion of Georgia was part and parcel of reasserting Russian hegemony. Let me make an argument. The argument is that our concern with the Soviet Union was the expansionist nature, the deadly serious nature particularly in the early decades, of the communist, the specifically communist threat. If Vladimir Putin wants to cobble together the old empire, all he's doing is behaving the way Russians have behaved for centuries. They're paranoid about their borders to, toward Europe. They're terribly frightened about the Muslim populations on the south. They've always dreamed of a, of a uh, warm water port. Uh, 
And this is just the way the Russians have behaved for centuries. Europe was able to deal with it. We ought to be able to deal with that. They're no longer trying to undermine us in Central America or uh, establish communist regimes in Africa. We can live with these people now. Well, I'd, I'd love to find a way to live with the Russian people. I don't have anything against them, however paranoid their leaders may be. But this pattern of Russian behavior is very troubling. Take Georgia. It's not just the suppression of a small bordering state. Uh, although that's bad enough. The population of Georgia is what, about 4 million, as I recall? Yeah, it's, this it's is a hardly, small... a, hardly a threat to Russia, let's All put right. it that way. Okay. Uh, but, but I think what it was intended to signify had a couple of important aspects. Number one, to any former republics of the Soviet Union, don't get too close to the United States. There's a price to pay for that. And, and that causes us trouble right now in Central Asia as we try and prosecute the war in Afghanistan. Second, the invasion of Georgia showed, not that anybody had much doubt, that Russia could cut off the Baku, Tbilisi, Chehan pipeline route, the only pipeline route of oil and, and also natural gas out of the Caspian Sea Basin that doesn't already run through Russia or Iran. So the, the, this very important natural resource uh, question, I think, was something that the Russians are quite concerned about. They've demonstrated it as well by cutting off the flow of oil and natural gas into Western Europe. Uh, and, you know, they, they do have uh, sort of out-of-area views as well. The cooperation between Hugo Chavez and Venezuela and Russia uh, is also pretty disturbing. So that's why I think we need a strong, resolute American response. All right. Now, you have advocated, well, let me I'll quote you once again, Russia's made it clear that it will not accept a vacuum between its borders and the boundary line of NATO membership. And you've argued then that the United States and our NATO allies ought to invite Ukraine and Georgia to enter NATO, correct? Right, to begin the process to begin of the formal process. membership. Right. Right. So you know what the argument against that is. The argument against that is that NATO, when it comes right down to it, is a military alliance, the central point of which is that all the members agree to recognize an attack on one member as an attack on all. And John Bolton is now arguing that American soldiers, if push came to shove, uh, should be placed in the position of going to fight and possibly die for Georgia. That can't make sense. Well, I think that, uh, that the issue here is demonstrating to the Russians that the use of military force uh, on their periphery is not going to succeed. And NATO and the United States have really already taken the first step by admitting uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and as well as Central and Eastern Europe. We already have NATO members bordering on Russia now. Uh, uh, I leave Belarus out of the equation. If they want to reunify with Russia, that's not causing me any loss of sleep. But the fact is that the Russians are pushing out now in Ukraine. They're granting Russian passports to Ukrainian citizens of Russian descent. They are laying the basis, as they have already in the Transnistria area of Moldova as well, for further military aggression. So what I'm suggesting is you eliminate the uncertainty and by uh, by making it clear that we're not going to tolerate military expansionism, you actually reduce the prospect that it will happen. Can I step back for just a moment, um, going back more than two decades actually, during the 1980s, Irving Kristol wrote several pieces in which he said, look, NATO made all the sense in the world after the Second World War when Europe was still prostrate and the United States needed to be involved defending Western Europe against a determined communist threat, the Red Army, Stalin, and so forth. But by the time the 1980s came along, these economies were prosperous. The defense of Europe should be left to Europe. And by covering for the Europeans, permitting them to spend more on the welfare, we were infantilizing them. That, and isn't there something to that? And shouldn't we be looking at ways of winding down NATO and encouraging the Europeans to take care of Ukraine on their own? Well, I think there's a very strong case that Europe, Europe is doing a pretty good job of infantilizing themselves, that their, their unwillingness to look outside their borders uh, is an increasing problem for us and, and for them, although they don't appreciate it. I think... But they, uh, wouldn't, they wouldn't step two a little bit if we took those last 50,000 troops out of Germany and said, fellas, you're on your own. The, 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 the expansion of NATO really today does more to protect the Eastern and Central European countries than it does the Western Europeans. The real test for NATO now uh, is in Afghanistan, and I think our European friends are not proving up to it. It's why the Canadian defense minister recently said NATO was having an existential crisis to decide whether it could go on. I think NATO could be a powerful global influence 
bringing in uh, Australia, uh, Japan, Israel, perhaps other India? countries. I wouldn't bring in India at this point, no. But I would say that uh, the, the issue of whether NATO has a future is up to the Europeans. And if they don't begin to bear more of their fair share, uh, I, I could certainly understand why people would think that it has to be reevaluated. All right. Iran. John Bolton, quote, Iran's test, this is a, an extremely striking formulation of yours. Iran's test salvo of ballistic missiles last summer shows how close the Middle East is to a fundamental, in fact, an irreversible turning point, close quote. Explain. Well, if Iran gets nuclear weapons that it can deliver, uh, not just against Israel, but against the neighboring Arab countries as well, there will be a fundamental shift of power in the region, and a shift that I think is irreversible. Uh, in fact, it's not just an Iran with nuclear weapons we should fear, it's the consequence of that. This is what we mean by proliferation, because Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Turkey, possibly others will want nuclear weapons as well, and then we will be in a really uh, fundamentally more dangerous situation. But what Iran is doing here through its pursuit of nuclear weapons, through its financial and uh, military support of terrorist groups like Hamas, Hezbollah, the Taliban, uh, is engaging in a, in a broad campaign to expand its influence geographically within Islam uh, and in the world as a whole. Stop there. Pause there for just a moment, if you would. 66 million people in Iran. It's dominated not by Arabs but by Persians, although there are lots of other ethnic groups contains some of the richest deposits of oil and natural gas in the, in the entire world and governed by an Islamic theocracy. It's a big, rich country. Again, what does it want? What are its motivations? What is it after? Well, under this government, under the Islamic Revolution of 1979, I think clearly it is motivated by a desire for hegemony uh, within the Islamic world of the, the, the Shiite branch of Islam over the Sunni branch. Uh, and it is pursuing a Persian uh, objective as well, and bearing in mind Persians are only about 50 percent of the overall population inside Iran. Uh, but it has, uh, it has global ambitions. I don't think there's any question about it, and all of them are adverse to the United States. So that's why I think our priority uh, has to be keeping Iran from getting nuclear weapons. The other things that it's doing are much harder to stop, but once it has a nuclear capability, uh, all, all bets are off. John Bolton writing last July, quote, Israel is now at an urgent decision point whether to use military force against Iran, close quote. Has the moment passed? Does this new government in Israel that Benjamin Netanyahu is now forming still face that decision? I, I think the, the matter is even more urgent than it was before. You know, there are lots of estimates when Iran will actually have a nuclear weapon. Uh, all of those estimates are based on publicly available information you can get from reports of the International Atomic Energy Agency. What frightens me is what we don't know. And it would be hard to believe the Iranians weren't doing a lot kind of off the books somewhere that we're not aware of, meaning that they're much closer to a capability uh, than we might think. And there's a more fundamental point, and that's this whole idea of just-in-time non-proliferation is extraordinarily risky. Uh, if you Explain think, that term. I, if, I, if you think that Iran is a year and a half away from nuclear weapons and that means you've got a year and a half more of diplomacy, if you're wrong in that estimate, if you, you're lose, six months, you right. lose the possibility. Moreover, the military option for Israel or for the United States is declining. Iran is getting more sophisticated defense weapons. They are certainly dispersing their existing nuclear facilities, hardening them, making it much harder now, to, uh, to go military. Am I not mistaken that attempting to cripple the Iranian or even just delay the Iranian nuclear program would involve a massive military operation? I, I, I'm under the impression that there are sites all ac across the country. It's a great big country. The, the Israeli yeah. Air Force, it would be strained, wouldn't it? Well, it's, In other it's words, a, is, it, is it actually an op, a military option? Could, oh, absolutely. They could do it. Yeah, it's a very risky and unattractive option. Let's be clear. No, nobody should want the, to pursue the military option if there were any other possibilities uh, around. But the fact is now, I think we're down to uh, the use of military force against Iran's program or Iran with nuclear weapons. And the, the Obama the, administration would never consider it. So it's up to Bibi Netanyahu or no one. I, I think it's up to Israel. And I think they've demonstrated in the past when they saw an existential threat to the state. They bombed the Osirak reactor outside of Baghdad in 1981. In September of 07, they destroyed a North Korean reactor in Syria. Uh, it, it is doable because what you need to accomplish is breaking Iran's control over the nuclear fuel cycle at one or more key points.
points, destroying their uranium enrichment capability at Natanz, destroying their uranium conversion capability at Esfahan. That doesn't solve so there are only the problem. a couple of sites you could if you, you could, could do it if you could penetrate a couple of sites. The, the more the better, obviously. But if you break it at, at at least one point, you buy two, three, or more years that puts time back on the side of those of us that don't want Iran with nuclear weapons. Normally, time works for the proliferator. This is an effort to reverse that calculus. Listen to a quotation from then candidate Barack Obama. Quote, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, these countries are tiny compared to the Soviet Union. They don't pose any serious threats to us. If Iran ever tried to pose a serious threat to us, they wouldn't stand a chance. We should use that position of strength to be bold enough to go ahead and listen. Close quote. What do you make of that? Well, you know, that's, uh, that's easy for uh, a candidate to say who doesn't really know the full extent of what Iran's program is. Moreover, nobody's suggesting that Iran is going to attack the United States. The whole point is that a, an Iran with nuclear weapons would become an enormous power in the region, which President Obama may now understand is where a lot of the world's petroleum and natural gas come from. Uh, you know, many of the Arab states of the Gulf region are just as opposed to Iran getting nuclear weapons as Israel is. There's, a, there's almost a united front on that point, although nobody's going to say it in those terms. So the threat to the United States of a direct Iranian attack uh, is, is probably nil at this point. But the threat that Iran could pose to our interests and those of our allies is enormous. Last question on Iran. I just read you a quotation from candidate Obama in which he said, oh, let's just listen to Iran. What is your feeling about President Obama and his Secretary of State Hillary Clinton? Can we safely conclude that what I just read was that's the talk of a campaign He's president, he's getting the daily intelligence briefings, he's an intelligent man, he is a patriot. He's not going to be thinking that way now. Is that a safe assumption? I don't think we can draw a conclusion firmly one way or the other, but I must tell you the evidence uh, with a little bit more than a month gone of the administration is this is a very naive, inexperienced, and uninformed administration. All right. Segment five, our final segment, John. John Bolton, public intellectual. You served as President Bush's ambassador to the United Nations. Now listen to a couple of quotations about the UN. Gene Kirkpatrick, the late great Gene Kirkpatrick, who was one of your predecessors as a UN ambassador, quote, it is quite clear that the United Nations remains a world body that is capable of making very important contributions to freedom of conscience and to human rights, close quote. That's the late Gene Kirkpatrick. Here's the late Senator Jesse Helms, quote, Many Americans see the UN aspiring to establish itself as the central authority of a new international order of global laws and global governance. This is an international order the American people will not countenance." Close quote. Which view is closest to yours? <laughs> well, I think Jesse's is. I think Jean was, uh, was always optimistic on the human rights front, but I tell you, if she were here today, uh, she would tell you that the UN's human rights record uh, truly is appalling. And as we watch the Obama administration now reinsert the United States into the so-called Durban II process, this upcoming uh, convention on, uh, on international racism, I think you can see all of the problems that, uh, that uh, the people have talked about with UN decision John, making. John, people who loved the United Nations or, or were optimistic about the United Nations said, all right, the Cold War put a lot of things into a deep freeze, including the UN. Because so many members, the Soviet Union was on the Security Council, so many met the Warsaw Pact, so many members were under the influence of the Soviet Union, it just couldn't act. It froze up the institution. But with the end of the Cold War, we were supposed to see a rebirth of the, of the UN, and it didn't happen? No, there was a huge burst of optimism in the 1990s, no question about it, when the Cold War ended. But let's look at the two central threats to international peace and security of our time. One, the global threat of terrorism, and second, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Just as the UN Security Council was gridlocked, uh, during the Cold War, so today the Security Council has been gridlocked in dealing with terrorism and proliferation. Uh, very ineffective, unable to agree on a definition of terrorism. Uh, sanctions against countries like Iran and North Korea blocked by the Russians and in some cases the Chinese. I must say our European friends, Britain and France, not demonstrating 
uh, leadership and solidarity with us on being really tough in the Security Council. So I don't see the Council, which is the one body of the UN that you could say act. functions uh, right. effectively, as just not performing in these critical areas of uh, international peace and security. From the UN to the State Department, of which you are persistently critical. Not long ago, for example, you wrote, quote, state's permanent bureaucracy has been trying to wish away North Korea's uranium enrichment program, close quote. And this is the way you often write about the State Department. The per permanent bureaucracy won't face this, that, or the other vital reality. How come? What is it inherent to the State Department? Is it a matter of bad leadership? There, there's a culture that's developed over decades, and it's one reason why it won't change overnight, even with uh, a new Secretary of State. There are many very, very well-qualified civil servants there who would respond to the proper leadership, uh, but it will take a, uh, a massive revolution of values and institutions at the State Department to make it into what it should be, advocates for America, not apologists, not people who seek compromise for the sake of compromise, who value process over substance, but to make them into our advocates. Uh, other countries are able to do this with their foreign service. We ought to be able to do it with ours. You served in the Bush administration, but you're critical of it all the same. For me, at least, one of the central puzzles is that for those four long years when the war is going, slipping sideways at best, and the president seems very deferential to the advice he's getting from the Pentagon and indeed from Bremer on the ground. By January 2007, when he announces the surge, everybody's, everybody's opposed to the surge. And indeed, Jim Baker has just published a report, the Baker-Hamilton Commission, in effect giving him a way out, uh, calling for withdrawal. And instead, he overrules virtually the entire foreign policy establishment and says, no, we're going forward with the surge. And incidentally, it worked. But what accounts for this four years, I'm talking about the president himself, this four years of deference and suddenly steal? What happened? I can't really account for it, it's, uh, but, but I think it's unfortunately uh, emblematic of a lot of other problems in the administration where the president ceded uh, White House authority to his cabinet secretaries, listened to them uh, perhaps more than to his own instincts. I don't think we should ever forget the Constitution was very serious when it made the president the commander-in-chief. Uh, and I think deference to the military commanders uh, has to be tempered by the responsibility the president has for the political outcome. It's not enough to say, I'm going to be guided by what my generals tell me. The president has to tell them what he wants, and then they have to figure out how to get it. All right. John Bolton. You're critical of the Bush administration for, in effect, being uh, too soft, leaning too, too much toward listening and soft diplomacy with regard to Iran and North Korea and Russia. And yet, John, the Bush administration is already starting to look, in retrospect, like the toughest administration we're likely to see for some years to come. So the question is, how do you conceive of your role as a public intellectual today? Have you placed yourself so far outside the mainstream that you've become a kind of Jeremiah, a prophet who, who may be appreciated a century from now, but who has very little effectiveness at the time? Or do you actually intend to be a voice that has a direct effect in the current making of policy? How do you conceive your role? Well, I'm not writing for 100 years from now, that's for sure. Uh, I, think, I think we're in a period of great crisis for the United States, and I think that a weak administration, which this has every prospect of being, will invite challenges. What, what's provocative internationally is weakness, not American strength. And I think that uh, the direction the Obama administration is taking is very, very troubling. I, I saw this as a major problem at the end of the Bush administration, that, that today we will see the Obama uh, team say, well, how can you criticize us? We're simply doing what the Bush administration would do, as they have on North okay. Korea already. So, so let me ask you again, this question of effectiveness. I, we discover within the first 10 days of the Obama administration that amazingly enough, the stimulus package is so much of an overreach in the House that Republicans find each other and discover much more quickly than they probably themselves had expected political ground on which to stand. All 177 of them vote against it. Eric Cantor emerges as a major figure in the House. Is there some analogous movement 
in foreign policy taking place? Are you involved in some kind of, are, are Republicans fight or an opposition finding ground on which to stand? Yeah, well before Lloyd Benson uh, of today says it, I will acknowledge I'm no Winston Churchill, but let's not forget that Winston Churchill did stand alone during the 1930s, during much of the 1930s, uh, warning about the threats that he saw from Hitler's Germany. And I think that the responsibility of somebody like myself who's had the privilege of uh, serving in senior administration positions is to write the truth as we see it about the foreign policy challenges the United States has uh, and hope that uh, hope that will be persuasive. Let's close the interview if we may with four short answer questions. How's that? At the was the United States safer or in greater danger at the end of the Bush administration than at the beginning? I think it was safer because of the decisions that it took, but, uh, but there are still a lot of threats, some of which grew worse during his tenure. Is the United States safer or in greater danger now that Barack Obama has taken office? I think we're in greater danger, no question about it. Will the United States and Israel permit Iran to acquire nuclear weapons? I think in the Obama era that's a decision that Israel alone is going to have to make and I would be surprised if they're content to sit with an Iran with nuclear weapons. Final question. When President Bush left office he was able to say that he had prevented a second terrorist attack on the country. When President Obama leaves office, will he be able to say the same? I'm very worried that he won't be. I think that was one of President Bush's signal accomplishments, and I think the country will judge his successor uh, very harshly if he can't say the same thing. Ambassador John Bolton, thank you for joining me. Thank you. For Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, I'm Peter Robinson. Thanks for joining us.